All right, so we'll just get started. And uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I hope that camp is going well. I kind of asked that already. But um, my name is Ashok, and I'm going to talk about Drupal and the software development lifecycle. And um, regarding what I do, I'm a web person, and I've, I've done some open source stuff here and there, namely in Drupal, and in a few other places too. And um, you know, I, I really like thinking about software. I, I just love work, developing, programming, working with it. And um, regarding this presentation, if you have any questions, just ask them along the way. Um, and regarding this talk, I mainly wanted to talk about it because at my workplace, we use Drupal in really unconventional ways. Um, mainly because we, we have an app that we, that we build and support. Um, it has a lot of custom code, and it connects with a lot of different external APIs for our thing. So like it's connecting to uh, a service called BlueShift for sending out mails. It connects to Redshift for long-term data storage. It's using a bunch of the AWS stack that I don't normally associate with a Drupal stack um, uh, talking with that stuff. And um, we follow a variant of the, the software development lifecycle called the secure software development lifecycle, uh, mainly because we, we're also a bank. And um, so um, there's, a, um, there's a, an organization called OWASP that kind of deals with that. And we follow the, the, the steps they suggest for some of that stuff. And I'll kind of go over a little bit of that, but I'll mainly be talking about just the, the leaner version of it with it. And so, you know, over the years, when I've, as I've worked with Drupal, my thoughts have gone from like, oh, Drupal is, is this amazing tool that lets people do, you know, they can add content, they can add views, they can, people can create these amazing websites and you can feel very, very powerful when you're doing that. And you can, you feel like you're really making change in this world um, when you're building out some of these sites. Like, especially where, when you think about where Drupal came from with uh, making sites for grassroots organizations and things like that. It's, it's a very empowering tool. But you know, over the years, as I've tried, made different types of sites and, and now apps with it, um, I think of it as software. And, and I know that you know, sometimes the people think of it that way, sometimes they don't. But I just want to kind of say that we should treat Drupal in that way, too. And when I mean treat it that way, we think about Drupal within the scope of its life cycle. And, and what that all means. And I'm basically repeating this slide, so that's why I put in a little stupid joke in there. And um, so what does that mean? Um, it means that when you're building out a Drupal site or Drupal feature or whatever it is, it's, it's going to be going through this, this loop um, through, through everything. Because uh, once you build a site, it doesn't mean that it's the end of it, just like with any software. You have to maintain it. You, you're probably going to be building, up, building it out more and more. Maybe it generates money, and you're going to be figuring out ways to make it make more money, which means you're tacking on more features and things like that. So um, again, it's going through this cycle for anything that you're doing with your software. And so let's just talk through a little bit of what these different stages are. So first we have the planning stage. And that's just to get a rough idea of how difficult a given request might be. So it could be something like, I want a website. And that's a big request. That's a very vague request. We don't really know what that, there's a lot of stuff that we need to um, do. And maybe we need to split it up into multiple parts. Or it could be as simple as, I need to add an image on the home page. So that's a very clear, concise request. And, and again, then you can start, you might do some rough time cost with that stuff and, and all, all of those kinds of things. Um, and then from the planning stage, we go into analysis. So like, okay, we have some requests for what needs to be made, whatever it might be. Um, we're going to be taking a look at what all it entails at this point. So who are the stakeholders in this? Um, what kind of functionality are they looking for out of it? So if it's a website, does it have a calendar? Okay, what kind of calendar is it? Is it with a calendar view or is it a listing? What might it be? And um, again, some of the stuff might filter back into the planning stage. So like once you've figured out the major features, maybe now you're going to start planning out these major features and then breaking it down some more. Um, and so it helps you get a better timeline to see how it's going to fit into your project. 
And then off of that, maybe you start creating some tickets and things like that. So from there, we get into the, ah, sorry, I came back from lunch, I'm sweating like a pig, and uh, I might sound weird, but I apologize for that. Um, we get into the design stage, and that's where we start to think about how our features are going to be built. So it might be from a large perspective of how is this site going to be built. So that's where we're making this large, big decision to something like, okay, how are we going to put the image into the site? Or how are we going to have our calendar listing? Maybe we talk about what modules we're going to use, or themes, or uh, JavaScript libraries, or is it all custom work? Um, and so, and those kinds of decisions. And then, of course, the, the most fun part of any project is the implementation part, which is, you know, you, you start installing your modules, or you start writing your custom code, and then you actually start seeing what you're talking about coming to life at that point. So, yeah, you write your code, and then maybe as part of it, Oh, well, definitely as part of it, it goes to some sort of a code review by some other person just to make sure it's not um, totally horrible code and, um, and making sure that it starts matching the requirements that you have for this stuff. And maybe you have some testing to help along the way for some of this stuff too. And yeah, then we get into a testing phase where we're talking about automated testing or manual testing. We're making sure that nothing else is breaking as a result of you in introducing these these new things to your site and making sure that the requirements are, are met by you know whoever you're responding to for this stuff and that they sign off on it because sometimes people will say oh it looks good you put it out there and they say oh it looks horrible it's like but we verbally agree or we didn't sign off on it and then finally we get into the release and maintenance phase which is where we deploy it to our servers the people around the world see it they love it or hate it whatever it might be, um, but now comes the difficult part where all of the stuff that you decided from planning to analysis to design to all of that comes into the maintenance space, where you're trying to make sure that your software remains stable and it remains secure. And you know, with any software, um, the hardest parts are planning because you just need to figure out where do you even start with this stuff. Um, and then same with analysis to kind of you know, get some consensus of making sure you're going down the right path with this. And then maintenance is definitely a very difficult thing because it's, again, like I said, it's building on everything that, that happened before it. And you want to just be able to make sure your software continues to remain um, safe, so to speak. So when I think of, when I think of Drupal, you know, when I, when I was first giving this talk, I, I was talking with uh, my coworker about it, and then he said, is it just going to be about that don't recommend Drupal? And, and, and I've been called a Drupal hater, too. Um, but I don't think so, um, because Drupal really falls well into the design and into the build phase. It's, there are tons of contributed modules out there. There are tons of contributed themes. Um, when you want to create content models or design your aspects, you have a UI that you can do some of this stuff in. Um, it's a fabulous tool for doing these kinds of things. Um, and you can, you know, sometimes you can spit out your website or whatever it might be really quickly. And you know, I went to Rain's talk this morning, and we were talking, and she was talking about accessibility, and Drupal does that really well out of the box. So, you know, th there are lots of things that Drupal does really well that it's good at, but at the same time, the parts that it's not so great at compared to certain other software is probably on the testing part, which is where um, Sean has a session, I'm trying to remember, I believe tomorrow, on continuous integration and testing, which I think is worthwhile to go to. Um, and, and again, then you might need to integrate it with like PHP unit or BHAT to, to do some more, um, to do some more uh, testing related stuff, but it's generally not been a focus that I've seen within Drupal itself. Like you build out a site, Someone will just say visually, it works, and then you put it out there. But it's not necessarily going through, did something else break as part of it? It doesn't always happen. And the few times when we've had manual testing in my previous, uh, at one of my previous places, the testing was manual, and it took over five hours before a deploy would be signed off on. So it would just be this time-consuming process. And I feel that that's something that Drupal could improve on. 
Uh, sure, I'm going to get into it, but at work we use Probo for, as, as part of our uh, suite of tools for testing, and then we pair it with BHAT and PHP unit for, for our stuff. And then for, regarding from a maintenance perspective, um, a lot of software is weak, but I think Drupal has, uh, definitely has other things at hand that make it um, something to think about, and it's in terms of dependencies. So not only do we have Drupal module or theme dependencies, at, le at least with D8, we also have all of the PHP library dependencies. So stuff like Symfony, like Laravel, or Lumen, like generally we're just dealing with the vendor dependencies and, and worrying about those being up to spec and, and safe. With Drupal, we're also worrying about the module side. So it's like, as a maintainer, it's like if you have 200 modules, and I've seen that, it's like, oh crap, every single day or every single week, there's a security release that's coming out, and you're just like, great, I need to stay on top of it and see, like, does this affect me or not? And so, and also different people manage software differently. So what might be stable to me is not necessarily stable to someone else, and vice versa. And this is not taking away from custom development either, and, and this applies to all projects for, for custom development, because it can consist of security holes, and quite frankly, everyone writes shitty code. You look, at, you look back at the stuff you write five years from now, you'll be like, what the fuck is this? I want to, I want to purge this whole thing. So, so let's go through the steps. And how do I make planning easier? Because it all starts from step one. So what you want to do is you want to just have some sort of a planning document. And um, there's a really good article written by Lullabot on how they estimate their projects. And it goes through breaking down what the site needs and then just starting to have estimates from different people within the team uh, start to give estimates on what needs to be done along with how long they think something will take. Like, it's a very rough idea. It's not even going into, oh, starting to look at libraries mm -hmm. or modules or anything like that. It's like, oh, this site needs a calendar. Mm, I might use this. It'll probably take five hours. It's, it's not even going into the requirements for that stuff. And, and that's where stuff like Google Docs and Excel they're really good at this kind of thing. Uh, you don't really want to break the stuff down into tickets quite yet. You just want to be able to have something that can calculate your hours or, or just lay out some of these high-level things um, for the stuff. And I'm just going to go into showing what the spreadsheet looks like. So let's see. Wow, this does not scale well in full screen. There we go. You can click the arrow on the right and give yourself a little more room. The, the carrot on the right. The carrot on the right. This thing? It's just lower there. Here? I have two more dots. This thing? The left. The carrot. Ah, thank you. TIO. Um, yeah, so this is their, like they have a master estimate sheet in here. And that's where it's like you want to just have, you want to build out, let's say, a site. And then you just might write, needs a calendar, needs a, um, a reader's club, needs a, uh, needs a home page, needs a hero image, things like that. And then you'll start writing some notes for it. You're not going to the final solution in this quite yet because that's the thing that comes in the analysis or, or later stages. Um, how certain you feel about the direction it's going to go in, uh, and then into how long different parts are going to take for the stuff. So then you have a low estimate, you have some sort of other estimate, and then it just tabulates all that stuff for you. And then they have a separate screen that, that puts all this stuff together for you as well. It's fantastic. It's definitely worth at least um, giving a look and, and, and just reading the article that they have for this thing. So, yeah. Oops. And then, like, once you get into, you know, your planning stuff, once you have those high-level things, um, you're now starting to go into the analysis portion. And when you're thinking about analysis, again, Lullabot goes into that document and how they think about stuff. But this is where you can start really getting your developers or, 
or if it's just you really thinking about that problem some more. And that's where you're like, okay, I, they might start doing a little bit of research into it, like, okay, uh, is the calendar module the right solution for this thing? Or do I need to use some, um, some Google calendar for, for this stuff? Or maybe I need to do something custom for it. And, and then you start getting their estimates and just seeing how it compares to the original estimate that you gave. If it's around the same area, then it's like, okay, you know you're headed down the right path. Um, if, it's, if it's a huge difference, like let's say you, you, you thought it was going to take five hours and then a developer says it's going to take 20 hours, and it's like, how did I get this wrong? Like, how is my estimate so far off? And, and then you, you can start talking and discussing about what, what needs to change for all these things. And so yeah, um, based off of that stuff, then you might start making decisions regarding your design for this thing as well. And regarding design, it doesn't just come down to the individual feature, like I said. It comes down to how you're going to approach building out this site. And that's where you might start thinking about, like, coming up with a plan for what needs to be done. So it's like, what modules are we going to, what modules solve it? How long is it going to take to enable or, or, or configure it to, to get it be a, to be the right thing? Um, are there any external vendors that we could use to solve something like this? Um, is there any custom work? Or do we have to make any changes to the infrastructure that we have? So like if you're self-hosted, maybe you suddenly need a bunch of new libraries that you didn't before for this stuff. Or, or similarly, if you're with an external, like let's say you're with Pantheon or something, and you're using something like, you, you suddenly introduce R into your SAC. You're like, Pantheon doesn't solve that, so what do you do? And so, again, this may start getting separated. This is where you can um, separate into multiple tickets for all of that, or, yeah, for all of that stuff. And that's where you can start using, like, Jira or Basecamp or Unfuddle or, or, or whatever, or Trello or whatever the tool you want to for this kind of thing. And you know, I, I want to, again, I don't hate Drupal. I, I, I'm quite the opposite. But at the same time, Drupal is not the best tool for everything. We have WordPress for, for like a basic CMS or, or stuff that's, that, that's for, for that kind of ecosystem. We have Laravel for building out apps. There's also stuff, other languages like Python or Ruby or Go that might be a good fit. Or you just don't host it on any of those and use something like Squarespace or Wix. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, you might also not want to host it on your own. So you might use Platform or Acquia or Pantheon or, or one of those kinds of hosting solutions for your stuff just to um, help mitigate some of the decisions down the line. And so this is going to be one of my stories that comes from all of this. And this is one where I had a rescue project where a client site was not updated for over four years. Um, it was built, and then it was put out there, never touched. Um, this wasn't a person that knew how to go into a server and then start updating it or knew how to update Drupal or anything like that. And within those four years, we had Drupal Geddon, we had, we had some pretty severe um, security issues that came out of Drupal. And so it did get hacked. And he came to me and he had to spend $500 to get things working again and, and to be bug free. Do you have a card? Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Are um, but I talked with them about it, and then it's like, I just asked him, why are you even using Drupal? And he said that the person that made it for me made it for me. And then I said that, looking at the kind of user you are, you should really be on something like Squarespace or Wix. And then I checked in two months later, and he is on Squarespace. So it's like, well, that's, like, they don't have to worry about the modules or any of that sort of stuff. It's like, I just want to have a site, I want to update it, and that's, that's the end of that and I'm gonna pay X amount of money to do it each month. So again, it's, it's a, as we're going through these steps, just think about what, what you're gonna use for your customer or stakeholder or whatever it is. Um, really think about it. And again, if accessibility or, there's things that Drupal is really strong at and I, I strongly recommend that to use Drupal for, for what it is good at. Um, so then we get into how to make implementation easier once you have made that initial decision. And that's where, you know, it's like you don't have a choice but to kind of get down into understanding the ecosystem of where you are, so becoming an expert. 
So it's, it's, it comes down to understanding, or am I going to use a contributed module or library or whatever that's out there, or am I going to do custom work? Because on the one hand, you have your contributed modules. It might get you 90% of the way there, but that last 10% might be really, really difficult versus some custom work that might be a little difficult, but you know it's going to work. Um, but again, then, then it's, uh, it may have its own issues for, for its stuff. Uh, you also want to try and have automated testing for this thing. So that's where it comes back to, you know, maybe learn BHAT or learn PHP unit or, or whatever language you're using. It's, it's a testing framework for all of this stuff. And, and have, some, uh, have some peer review. Just have somebody just look at it for, for one and, and say whether it, to check and see does it work and that the code is not too bad. Um, it's helped me out a bunch of times because there have been times where I've submitted code at my workplace for review and one of my coworkers rightfully called out and said, what the fuck is this? Can you please rewrite it? And then we talked about it and, and, he, and then we, we went back and forth over it. And it's like, okay, how about if I do this, I go down this approach and work on it. And, and then you know, I get feedback and then I do something and, and then I know that at the end of the day, once that thing is out, it's going to be in a good place for the whole team. And, you know, at, at our, like I said, at our workplace, we, because we deal with a lot of external vendors and things like that, we don't have any choice but to write custom code. But I also want to say that even for your day to day, um, as part of um, the stuff that you think about when designing your, um, your features and whatnot, you know, really think about making custom code an option. Um, it will, it'll take you there. Um, like, because a custom modular <coughs> submit might just be fine for your needs. Um, instead of trying to, and, and you know, if you're using a, a really complex module like panels, let's say, or whatever, you can always put a patch back for it. But you could also just roll your own thing that's with one SQL query and, and call it a day. And then you could blog about it and then everyone knows how to do it. Um, I, I kind of had a story to go with it, and I think it's in one of the later slides. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get back to that one. And then regarding testing, um, you know, you could start off with something really simple. Like uh, I mentioned the manual approach, which takes five plus hours. But at the end of the day, at least someone was, was testing it out and making sure that it all works. So it could be as simple as visiting the pages in your site or application. It could involve logging in and writing a whole lot, like basically just detailing out all the steps that, that you want to test out for everything in your site, and someone is just going to do all that manually, or a bunch of people are going to do it manually. Or you look at the Drupal extension module, which is basically a way to integrate vHat with Drupal and, and then write tests off of that. Um, I have a, a sample module up, and I think I'll link to it in here as well. Um, but yeah, and, and then there's a talk tomorrow on this stuff too. Uh, but then based off of that, then you can start to use external services to help you as well. So if you, if you want to do it all, you know, as a DIY thing, then you could learn something like Jenkins or um, host a GitLab or something to, um, to run all of these automated tests for you. Or you could use something like Provo or CodeShip or, um, I'm trying to remember what Lullabot has for their, as their testing solution. Um, you could use one of those that basically just directly ties into Drupal with BHAT and all of this stuff, and it'll just start running the tests that you have for you for this thing. And you can have it fire on every pull request in Bitbucket or, or, or GitHub. And then you just, and then at the end of it, when someone else is uh, looking at the code, they'll see like, oh, it has a bunch of check marks for all the tests and everything that I've passed. And the nice thing with this is, at least that from what I found at my workplace is, um, it really encourages people to write more tests. Because it's like, you know, so I've gotten the question of where do I even start? I have the site already. It's like, well, someone just needs to write a test to get started. And, and I think we, we, when I joined, we had maybe a thousand tests in our suite, which is pretty darn good. But at this point, we're well over 20,000. And it's like, We've, we've run into pain points where our test suite takes a couple of hours to run. And it's like, that's not fun, but at the same time we know we're, we're being really diligent about, about our code base. And um, yeah, 
it, it really helps. Oh yeah, and I've linked to uh, testing Drupal with bhat in here, so you can visit that too. And then finally, based off all of that work and the decisions and all that stuff that you make, we get into the maintenance section. And I'm gonna start with some stories with this part first. Um, this is another client that I had, uh, that I have, that uses Drupal Lightning. And they didn't stay up to date for well over a year. Um, the Lightning requirements weren't pinned down and they didn't know that they were actually even signing up for Drupal Lightning when, when the vendor put it in for them. Uh, when they asked me to join on, uh, just trying to get Drupal back up to date took over 30 hours of work. And it involved a lot of pain through all that stuff. And when I got back down into it and I looked at just how much of the functionality from Lightning we're using, it's less than 30%. It was just like, was it even worth it to, to, to go down this path? Could we have just made something that's a little bit more custom uh, using Drupal still? but just um, instead of using that distribution, just putting other modules together to, to get all of that stuff done. And I think yes. Um, in another story, uh, a client used Drupal 7. Uh, they didn't stay up to date for over a year and um, they needed it to be compatible with PHP 7. They had some level of custom code, but because, of, but because, they, didn't, but because they had over 200 modules on their site, it took over 50 hours to get that whole site up to date and actually running with PHP 7 properly. And it's like, they, they got a big bill <laughs> at the end of it, at, but there was no choice. And PHP 7 is deprecated this year, so they're not deprecated 7.2. That's right, that's right, so. 7.2 is going to be at the end of this year and 7.2, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they could switch, try to switch to 7.3 and maybe miss some of those pain points to begin with. Um, but again, they'll just need to get back to me and see if they want to do it or, or deal with it. Um, that's up to them. And in this case, um, the client was upgrading from Drupal 8.4 to 8.5. I, I don't remember. It was, that's why I put 8.x to 8.x plus 1. And this is where Drupal had introduced some workflow stuff into core. Um, and they had a really robust notifications module within their site. And it broke, and it was over a thousand lines of code. And I was reviewing it. I didn't really understand too much of it. And I was going that, I don't think we're using a whole bunch of this stuff. It, it just seems really unnecessary. Um, and then I, 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 I thought about it, and then I rewrote it, and it was under 80 lines of code. So basically, the code base shrunk down by over 90% at that stage. So that's, that's where I'm coming back into the don't be afraid of custom code. It's like, it may just be really small snippets that you need for your stuff. And yeah, so that's where it's like, use fewer modules. So, you know, you might, do you want to use some really cus like really large, bulky module to solve one really small problem that you have? Or like, I maintain the font your face module on drupal.org. And it's, I think it's a great module, but I wrote it. So, but at the same time, if you just have one site, you could just add two lines of code into your theme layer for the font that you need. You don't need a gigantic module for two lines of code. And that's all I'm saying. And you also wanna try and audit the modules as much as you can. Some are obviously more difficult than others. Um, like if you wanted someone to audit the rules module, obviously that's, that's a big task. Um, but, you know, there are a bunch of other modules that can be, and maybe you can pay somebody to do that for you, too. Um, there are a lot of people in the Drupal community, locally and outside, that can help with that kind of stuff. And, you know, just, just understand some of Drupal's weak points and, and where that comes from. So, like I said before, versioning means different things to different people. Um, so, an example of this, so, sorry, I, I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent. And part of this comes down from thinking about semantic versioning. So we have a major version, a minor version, and then a patch. So when people are making changes to their code, you think of it as, am I maintain like the minor version is basically when it gets incremented, it's basically saying, I'm maintaining the existing contract that, um, 
that exists, or I'm just I'm doing like a security fix or something like that, or a bug fix. It's a really minor thing. Um, when I'm changing the middle number, that means I may be introducing a new feature. It's not necessarily breaking stuff, but it is a new feature. And when I increase the large number, the, the very first number, that means code has changed. Things that depend on it are probably going to break or might break. And, and you, you need to be careful before you upgrade your, your dependencies to this new version. Um, in the case of Drupal, we don't really have that because we have stuff pinned to the version of Drupal itself. So we have Drupal 8 dot some major version dot some minor version. So when people make changes to their code, um, sometimes you might actually be breaking some of your dependencies even though just the minor version part changed. So it's, it's stuff that you just need to be mindful about. And um, the Drupal schema updates part is fantastic. It's kind of always just worked, and I think that's one thing that Drupal does super well. Um, but the entity updates that got introduced are the exact opposite. Um, because Drupal tries to guess at what the schema changes are for your entities. So like if you have new fields or you remove something, it's going to try and guess to see, okay, how do I fill that in? And, and sometimes it fails if there's content. So then when you're trying to update your your entity mod, some sort of entity module that you have, you'll just say, can't do it, there's content, I don't know what to do. And, you, and, you, and, I'm, and I've been left with a, fuck, I, I have no, this, this sucks, that means I have to go into the SQL and, and, and try to do some stuff. And, and it still might not work. In fact, a site that I'm working on, it's on a, a version, of, there's a module installed on it from Contrib that I cannot upgrade to even the next the next increment of it, and the site doesn't use it, but if I uninstall it, then a whole bunch of stuff that the site does depend on is gonna get uninstalled as well. So I'm left in this shitty bind of what do I do in that scenario. Sure. So when you see that message, Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're thinking or is that what you're thinking? Yes. Okay. So that, that, it's always the same. I mean, that's kind of the same. Not necessarily. So if you're adding columns to your entity, then it typically is able to work with that. If you're removing columns from your entity, then that's where it's like, you have data in here. I'm not going to touch it. And it's, it's making a, to some extent, it's making a sound decision, but at the same time, it's like, I just want to move on with this stuff. And, right, so going off of that, we just want to make sure we keep our custom code up to date too. And this goes back to the one that had 50 hours of work related to it. So kind of just, A, just know of the changes that are coming to Drupal itself. Uh, thankfully, for the most part, Drupal's APIs are, are pretty good on that respect. And like if you use something like PHP Storm or, or whatever, It'll let you know that when you're using a function, it'll say that, oh, it's been deprecated, um, rename it to, to this new function. So it's kind of helping you keep track of like, okay, when the changes come for Drupal 9, this is still mostly gonna work. So, um, so yeah, Drupal core itself is really good that way about that kind of stuff. Um, and then similarly with PHP, just be mindful of the changes that might be coming. So like the move from PHP 5 to 7 was a big one. It broke a bunch of stuff. And thankfully, most, most people are past that now. But just keep keep mind of any changes that come with 7.1 through 3 and, and onwards as well. That's right. They, I mean, they want to be hard on customers for it. They, they do tend to give some leeway by the end of it as you get closer and closer. But at the same time, it's not like, oh, we're gonna give you another year to do it. It's like, we're we may give you another month to get it, get it up, but yeah, like you, you wanna start planning it now. Yeah. Yeah, on the side that I was working on, something broke when I tried to go from 7.1 or seven zero to seven one or, or something like that. And but thankfully it's a really small it's a one line change. Yeah. 
So, yeah, it's not bad at all. Um, but yeah, some of the key takeaways I want to have with this stuff is, you know, really plan the stuff out um, right from the beginning. Uh, like I said, it, it's, it's all about those early decisions that you make um, that are going to help you have a sane um, head of hair at the end of the day, and I clearly don't. So, um, yeah, really plan this stuff out. If you can, try to have automated testing or just have some form of testing to go with this stuff. Um, really know about, think about what you want to build out too, because like, you know, we're, we're getting into the stage where we talk about decoupled apps and th things like that too, and that's great, but that's, you're offloading some of the problems that are in the back end to the front end. And, and so that means like, you know, from Rain's talk, we talk, she talked about, about accessibility and all of this really good stuff that Drupal does out of the box regarding that. Now imagine having to rebuild all of that in your front end. It's like, that, that's a lot of work. So, so really think about those kinds of things when you're, when you're talking about decoupled apps or any kind of app for this stuff. And, and that's where I say like, Drupal is really amazing and it's, it's, but also think of it as one tool in your toolbox because there are a lot of really cool, cool pieces of software out there. Um, also vet your dependencies at, as much as possible and writing code is a lot of fun. Just don't be afraid of it. Um, other things that, that I would suggest are um, follow some of the security groups that are out there. So I've linked off to Drupal security group. You can, um, you can subscribe to it so then you can get, you get an email every Wednesday of what modules need security updates and things like that. Yeah? That's right, or certain people just say, oh, you need to upgrade your site, yeah. Um, so there's that, but um, outside of Drupal, there's also CVE, I'm trying to remember what it stands for. Um, shoot, Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures list, and you can subscribe to this for like PHP-related security issues or for MySQL or MariaDB or Ubuntu, like whatever version of Linux you use at, at your, um, for your infrastructure and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and, and also just like if you can host, don't try to self-host. That, that, that stuff always lands you in, in, in some deep water. Um, well, the, the site that I'm working on requires custom hosting, but like the pain points that we've run into from Trying to upgrade from Ubuntu 1404 to 1804 have been have been fun, um, in a not good way. So yeah, if if you have a a not too complex site, then you know just just try to host it on on someone that specializes in that sort of stuff. Um, and then regarding resources, um, the stuff from Lullabot is really great. Uh, if you're interested in following um, the OWASP approach to SDLC which basically takes all of the stuff that I talked about, but also puts in security in mind as part of that process. Um, they, have, um, they have their steps laid out, and then the top 10 security issues is the thing that most um, people that follow the OAuth approach will, will try to talk about. So like things regarding secure, um, SQL injection or um, cross-site request forgeries or um, credential stuffing and all of those kinds of things. And then there was uh, an article that I read regarding um, Drupal and, um, and, and some of the issues that you can run into. That was a pretty good article to, to read as well. And this is a giant list that I, I kind of put, put in just regarding uh, camp sessions that I felt were, um, were good things to, uh, that, that kind of related to this stuff. Uh, one was a beginner's guide from, uh, to modules by Rick. Um, the easy, easily accessible talk by Rain is also really uh, uh, something that ties well into some of this stuff. Um, there's the performance analysis talk that's going on right now by Oliver, um, and then getting ready for Drupal 9 by Chris. Uh, those are today, and then tomorrow there's configuration management, uh, keeping your Drupal app simple, uh, practical CI, which I've mentioned a bunch of times, and then there's one that's a world without features. And, uh, Anyone that's used the features module will probably be able to relate on just how much of a hellhole that, that can be. And uh, yeah, 
that's that's really about it for me. That's uh that's about forty minutes ish. So we have time for questions and things like that. Anything? Or anyone want to share fun stories or not so fun stories? Uh, sure. Like, do you want me to step through a module for that stuff, or? Sure. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, let's see. Let me look at the slides that I have for this stuff. It's been a while since I looked at this too, so so I apologize on that front. But um. It's been a really long time. Yeah, I can show what a given test looks like with BHAT and how it kind of ties into stuff. Yeah, so I think I'll link to this in, in um, for the session as well. But it kind of goes into how you set up stuff with it. So it talks about how you can set it up to work with um, Headless Chrome. And, um, and so then it'll use an actual browser to be able to run your tests as well. So you could do some front-end testing to go with this. And so when I have all of this stuff here, first thing I have is my bcat.yaml file. And inside it, I'm basically saying what it's, um, it's basically talking about how it's going to be configured. So in this case, we're using the Drupal extension module or plugin to go with this stuff. So when I look in this, in the suite section here, I can see that there's Drupal, Drupal extension, and a Drupal context to go with this. And what this allows me to do from here is basically the people that maintain it have a whole bunch of integrations that go in with Drupal regarding being able to clear your caches or to be able to log in as a, as a user with X role or, what, or all of those kinds of things. So like it, it has a bunch of steps that are built into it that, are, that really help you um, get started in, in doing some of that stuff within Drupal itself. Yeah, so like there'll be a command that says like, let's say you're in your testing environment, right? Then it says, when I have Drupal variable blah, blah, blah set to something else. So like you can kind of start changing some of your settings behind the scenes for this stuff too. Or that's where you can say, or I have this user with, um, with a content moderator role. Uh, when I'm logged in as that user and I try to add content, then I should see blah, blah, blah on the page. So. So along those lines, like, like this is just kind of helping set that, that portion up. And, and then down here, like, it says that, okay, for any JavaScript-related tests, we're going to be using Chrome. This is how it's going to be accessible. And then you just have to provide what your, your base URL for this thing is as well, for it to be able to access the, the website that you have. Uh, then, it, then it's going to know that it's going to use Drupal as the driver. If there's any Drush-related stuff, this is how it can access it and so forth. And so then when we get into our actual test for all this stuff, um, let's see. So like this is, this is one example of some stuff that I had. So like when I visit the home page, let's say as an example, um, right, so we can have like when I go to the home page, then the response status should be 200. So we're just making sure that your home page doesn't break after all of this stuff. And, and, since, and in this case, like I'm using JavaScript, so what you could do is you could have it, um, A, it's going to be 200, and then you're also going to take a screenshot of that page. So maybe you want to do some comparison of that image later on or for debugging purposes or something like that. Um, like that's, that's a really basic example of some of that stuff. Uh, let's see if there's one where... Right, so in this case... What I'm doing is when I'm logged in as a user with the administrator role, so it's going to create a user behind the scenes and give it the role of administrator 
automatically within Drupal. Um, and I go to the slash user page, then A, I should see the status code is 200, and I should see Workbench there, because maybe I have the Workbench suite installed, and I want to see like certain pieces in there that, that relate to that. So, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that's it's it uses a language called Gherkin, and and that's this is exactly how it's written. So so what'll happen here is you give it this language, behind the scenes there's going to be there are going to be functions that people implement that um, basically know that, that translates that string to a given function that it's going to use behind the scenes for that stuff. And if you don't have it implemented then then BHAT will basically say, oh, you need to implement this function, it'll give you like a stub for it, and then you just fill it in. So, and I think I might have an example of it in here, but I don't remember. Right, so the part where I had, I take a screenshot, like that's not really built into BHAT, but in this case, like what I did was I made a function that says then I take a screenshot and then it has some file name. And so I implemented it and it becomes this save screenshot with the file name. Because some of that stuff is already, because it knows that it ties into Chrome, it knows that it's able to take a screenshot of the page. And then same with clearing the page cache. That's where it's like, when I clear the page cache, it's gonna call on Drupal cache and, and delete all from it. And same with watchdog for that stuff. So implementing functions isn't all that difficult either with BHAT. And then, oh yeah, and then I had one that was just testing out all of the pages from a, from a sitemap that I had. So it's like, let's say you have like certain critical pages for your site, and you just wanna make sure that they all return back something good. Um, there's something called a scenario outline for, for BHAT, and that basically says that um, given a bunch of um, bunch of rows of data, run this this particular test through all of them. So in this case, that's right, that's right. And so like I have the, this one site that I maintain has a few thousand pages in its sitemap. So then I just generated, I have something that programmatically generates this part for me, and then I just have it run through that test. And it's like, it just, it's, it's a, it's just at least helping make sure that nothing is breaking, like actively, um, when, I, when I'm gonna go deploy some new feature. And how long would that take? This, the, this, I don't know, 15, 20 seconds tops. It, it should be faster than that. So I run, so, so for, for the stuff with my own clients, I run it locally, make sure it all works, mainly because they don't want to pay for an external testing infrastructure. But for the stuff that I do at work, that's where we use a service called Probo for it. And that ties into every single pull request that we have. And, and that, we, we did some magic to basically be able to make it run in 15 minutes for each pull request. And, um, and, that, and that's, a, that's thousands of fe different features that we have for that stuff. So, and um, on the Provo Slack, they also talk about how to do some of that magic. Like we, we've contributed all of that stuff back for, for everything, yes? We, we run it on every pull request. So no matter what, um, when new code is, new code is being introduced or code is being re removed, no matter what, we're running it through the test suite because we wanna make sure nothing is breaking. Um, in our case, like for, for, the, for the main stuff that I do, like it's a bank related site, so the site really can't go down um, so to speak, it's, it's, it's like unless we have planned downtime that we send to our, our customers for that stuff. So if we're upgrading a module, then yeah, it, 
we have a pull request that says upgrading um, context module. And, and then it runs through the test suite, and then we just see that is, is anything broken after this. And in most cases, it doesn't break. Sometimes, on the rare occasion, sometimes things will. But yeah, I mean, we, regardless, we need, we need it to go through that process. And similarly, when we refactor our code, it's like, are we breaking any existing contracts, basically? Uh, that's how we think of it when we write our test. It's like, think of it as a contract. So are we breaking any existing contracts by refactoring all of this code? That's why, like, with Probo, it's, all, it's um, offloaded to their service. And we have brought it... Pardon? Um, to some extent. I mean, yeah, they'll run it. We get back. In fact, I, oh, one sec. Let me just try and log in. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, like, it's not hitting our production environment in any way. And, like, they get a daily snapshot that So if I look at this and I look at a given pull request, you can see like there are check marks next to each of these things. That's our automated test stuff running in this case. So if I click on one of them, let's just see what happens. So yeah, they're just detailing out what the changes are for, for this given pull request. And at the end of it, somewhere, right. So down here we can see what all the, the checks were for this stuff and then can also go into the details regarding it. So we can see what tests ran and all of that sort of stuff. And again, this is in a completely separated environment for this stuff. And yeah, I'm not sure if I fully answered your question or not regarding this, but uh, yeah, it's it's completely offloaded from from our production environment, which was useful for us as part of the secure SDLC process. Like, they can't there can't be a way for the test environment to be able to talk to the production environment. It has to go. It can only go one way. Any other questions? Yeah. You can, yeah, so so let me just show you what. Well, I mean, this is all, again, in the test environment. You're not necessarily, you don't want to do this in production because you might, you're creating dummy accounts or dummy content and all that sort of stuff to go with it. But yeah, like this is stuff that we do here. So like we're creating this card art here that has, that has like certain fields that, that are part of our backend. Uh, we're creating some test accounts to go with it. 
we're, we're logging in the user, they go to a page, and then we're expecting them to see certain, certain things there. And then similarly, like here they see it for one particular bank, and then here, down here, we're making sure they see it for another particular bank for that stuff, along with some other details of things that they need to see for that page. So, yeah, it's, it's totally a part of our process for this stuff, and it has to be. Yep. I mean, it's great, right, to have an account that starts with one, two, three? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah. If that's it, then uh, thank you. <laughs>